a, a, a co-questioning Detective Duffy in yeah, stages? As long as it's, uh, uh, the, uh, the reporter has sufficient time to uh, prepare for that because that's where the greatest challenge is. Okay. Anything else? Uh, no. Right. Let's get the jury in. I didn't get the instructions done because I had a computer issue, which is now resolved, so I'll be working on it. Uh, good afternoon, folks, and let's continue with the state's case. State calls Detective Duffy to the stand. Can you state your first and last name, please? Kenneth Duffy. And uh, Mr. Duffy, uh, uh, how were you? Uh, are you pre Are you currently employed? No, I'm retired. And and uh, how were you previously employed? Um, law enforcement officer with the city of Kenosha. Retired at the rank of detective. At at detective rank. Yes. And how long were you a detective at the Kenosha Police Department? About 15 years. And how long did you work uh, for the Kenosha Police Department as a sworn officer all told? 28 and a half years. And when did you retire from the police department? Um, January 31st, 2018. Okay. So uh, I'm going to refer you to as Detective Duffy just out of habit and in deference to the retirement. Is that all right? Fine. Detective Duffy, uh, back uh, during the time period of uh, July uh, 23rd and 24th of 2017, were you ultimately assigned to participate in an investigation of uh, a missing person, uh, Olivia McKay? Yes. And ultimately was it determined that Olivia McKay uh, had died uh, by some kind of homicide? Yes. And were you then particip a participant in the investigation in, that, in, in those circumstances? Yes. And uh, did your involvement in this case then continue uh, essentially until your retirement in 18? Yes. Uh, when you uh, were part of the investigation in this case, did you have occasion to speak uh, to both uh, Jamari uh, Cook as well as Daniel Tate Jr. regarding Olivia McKay and the fact that she uh, had been found deceased? Yes, I did. And uh, did they, uh, at, at some point after speaking to the two of them, did uh, were you directed to a particular location in Kenosha where her life had ended? Yes, I was. And uh, where were you directed that her life had ended? Um, by the band shell um, located um, on 7th Avenue, about the 3500 block. So that's in the 35, 3600 block of 7th Avenue? Yes. Uh, do we call that Penoyer Park? Yes. And is that a location in the city and county of Kenosha? Yes, it is. And in the state of Wisconsin? Yes, it is. So I'm just going to show you a couple of quick pictures and ask you if... Having been directed to those locations, I'm going to show you States Exhibit 14. Is that the band shell that we're speaking of located at, in the area of Penoyer Park? Yes, it is. And where is the lake in relation to this picture? Well, that's facing west, so the uh, lake uh, would be to the east, so your back. When you're facing the band shell, the lake would be at your back. Okay. And then I'm going to show you what's been marked in as States uh, Exhibit number 60. And do you recognize what that's a picture of in the context of this investigation? Sure. It's um, Lake Michigan, um, the beachfront. And is this the beachfront at Penoyer Park? Yes. When you were directed to a particular location indicating that Olivia had died at Penoyer Park, was this the general location? In other words, this area of lakefront uh, where uh, you uh, were directed that her death had happened? Yes. So I'm just going to ask you, is this a picture then that was taken pursuant to this investigation to show uh, the general area where Olivia's life ended? Yes, it is. And uh, the lake we see there is Lake Michigan? Yes, it is. Uh, is this picture uh, a uh, appropriate, uh, accurate depiction of how the lake and the lakefront looks at the area of Penoyer Park where Olivia's car would have been parked when she died? Yes. And has it been changed or altered in any way that you see from the vantage point you had when you went to Penoyer Park pursuant to this investigation? No. Okay, I'm just going to direct you on Exhibit 60, and Judge, I would move addition to Exhibit 60 at this time. Is 
your objection? Can I just get clarification on which one is 60? I don't. I, I apologize. I either missed that or it didn't This is 60. Okay. No objection. The other one that I directed to, I think, was 40. Let me see. Mr. I. Are Detective, if I could ask you, could you go up and show me on Exhibit 60 where the sort of uh, contiguous, meaning uh, never interrupted lake begins in this picture as opposed to ponds or other bodies? Okay. Hold on for just a second. We're going to get you the microphone. In this um, picture, it's to the left here, which would be to the north, and continues south to the right here. Um, this water here, just to the north, uh, and the picture that's not shown is Pikes Creek, and this water, this little ponding area, changes depending upon the uh, amount of rainfall we get from Pikes Creek because it's constantly changing the um, course of Pikes Creek, um, which flows into Lake Michigan. So is what, what separates the ponding area from the larger lake? sand uh, so there is there so when we look at this picture it looks like grass takes us right to the edge of the pond is that true or yes or, or does the picture cut off some sand that we would also have there's sand just beyond the grass here very well Thank you. oops Detective Duffy, uh, in the uh, beginning stages of this investigation, was there another uh, police agency that did uh, much of the early investigative work? Yes. And which agency was that? Uh, Mount Pleasant um, Police Department in Racine County. And could you be basically describe for the jury why, if uh, Olivia McKay was a Kenosha resident, why a Mount Pleasant Police Department would do most of the early investigative work in this case. <clears throat> Olivia's um, body was found in their jurisdiction, found by some property owners on um, Monday, July 24th. Um, at that time, we weren't sure where the um, death actually occurred. We just know that at the time they found her body, she was deceased. And so during that period of time, did Mount Pleasant Police Department's officers pursue uh, warrants and other documents to try to investigate this case? Yes, they did. And uh, what was uh, Kenosha Police Department's role during that early stage? We were there to assist them in anything needed um, from us um, in our jurisdiction. Ultimately, on August 3rd, 2017, was an arrest made in this case? Yes. And what individual was arrested uh, and uh, then questioning pursued on that date? Um, Daniel Tate. Is, is the person you've identified as Daniel Tate here in the courtroom today? Yes. For purposes of the record, Detective Duffy, can you indicate where that individual is seated today and what they're wearing? Sure. He's seated to my right between his uh, two attorneys wearing... Um, a striped shirt and um, cornrow hair. Kind of a collar. Oh, it's a button collar. Well, <laughs> shirt collar. Yeah. Whatever you say. Go ahead. <laughs> Detective Duffy, uh, uh, were you uh, present when uh, the uh, individual you've identified as the defendant was uh, interviewed in this case? Yes. And did you participate in that interview? Yes. And uh, in that interview, uh, who did the defendant describe as his best friend? Jamari Cook. And uh, where did the defendant uh, indicate he had been staying during the period of July 22nd, July 23rd, July 24th? Where did he say he was residing? He was staying at his grandmother's house located at 902 Sheridan Road. Um, his grandmother's name is Patsy Tate. 
And how did the defendant describe to you that he was communicating with the outside world? What was he utilizing? He was using a cell phone which didn't have service but um, was able to um, access the outside world using uh, Wi-Fi. And did you, um, uh, did you specifically ask the defendant any questions about uh, an app on a phone called Meet Me? Yes. And what did the defendant uh, say to you, if anything, regarding whether he had been active on Meet Me? He indicated that he used the Meet Me app to meet um, girls. And did he indicate uh, what his specific uh, nickname or, or, uh, or name was, identifying name within the Meet Me app? Um, his profile name was D6. And was that D-E-E, then S-I-X? Yes. And did, what, if anything, did the defendant say about whether uh, he believed anyone had ever hacked into that account? He told me he didn't believe that anybody had hacked into his uh, Meet Me um, profile. Now, Detective Duffy, was one of your focuses in this interview to uh, determine what the defendant was going to tell you about uh, his contacts on Meet Me with Olivia McKay? Yes. Did you already know at the time that this interview was being conducted that the defendant, uh, under the name D6, that, that, that a contact uh, with a person named D6 had been in touch with Olivia as one of the last things that we were known, known contacts when she was alive? Yes. So uh, did you ask the defendant any questions about who the last person he, was, he had met on Meet Me was? Yes, I did. And what did you essentially say to him regarding that? Well, he responded when I asked him who uh, the last person he had contact with on Meet Me, he produced the name or told me the name of uh, Zeta Lopez. And that, that was on uh, August 3rd? Yes. Now, are you aware that his Meet Me had been closed down? Yes. So uh, this was not uh, something that he had had on for, I mean, if, if you know, when was it closed down in the context of uh, after the death of Olivia McKay? It was the same day her body was found on, on Monday, July 24th, 2017. So, when the defendant told you that the last person he'd met on Meet Me was Zita Lopez, um, did you have records already that allowed you to know whether that was accurate? Yes. Okay. And so, what, if anything, did you do next in general with the fact that you knew that was likely not accurate. As I continued to talk to Mr. Uh, Tate, the defendant, I asked him if he was sure about um, Zeta Lopez being the last person that he had contacted on Meet Me. I told him I was asking him that question for a specific reason, that I might already know who he had contact with. And based on that response, did what, if anything, did the defendant change in, in his original response about who he had last met on Meet Me? He then um, told me the name of Olivia. Instead of Zita Lopez? Yes. Did he indicate to you when he had had that contact with Olivia? Back on, I believe it was Sunday, July 23rd, 2017. So I, I just want to be clear. So the defendant specifically told you he was the one who was in contact with Olivia on July 23rd. Is that right? Yes. And did he tell you, what if anything did he tell you about whether he told Olivia that he was interested in having sex with her in that contact? Based upon the uh, Meet Me records, there's a conversation between the defendant, Mr. Tate, and uh, Olivia, Olivia McKay, the victim, that they were supposed to um, have sex at his grandmother's house, located at 902 46th Street. And did the defendant agree that was his communication with Olivia on Meet Me? Yes. So, did the defendant describe to you how he and Olivia were to find each other after this contact on Meet Me? They used um, Facebook messaging, in fact, when she was en route to 
his home on the evening of Sunday, July 23rd, 2017. He was waiting outside and actually saw her drive past his residence and sent a message to her asking if that was her that just drove by his house. And so I'm, I'm asking you what the defendant told you. So did the defendant tell you then that he did have contact with Olivia McKay on July 23rd, 2017? Yes. And did he tell you how she came to be at his grandma's residence? At his direction. And did he tell you her mode of transportation? Um, a car. Did he tell you anything about the car, if you remember? I believe we had a discussion about that. It was a four-door um, vehicle, silver in color. Did he tell you uh, whether Olivia had told him what her age was? Yes, she indicated that she was either 16 or 17 years of age. Did, he, did the defendant, what if anything, did the defendant tell you about what color Olivia's hair was? Um, he remembered that it was brown. What, if anything, did the defendant tell you about his estimate of how she looked and whether he was going to pursue sex with her? I think he, he said she was average, not real attractive. So what did the defendant at this point tell you was what happened in terms of contact? So he says that she arrived, and what is, in, in this first discussion with him, what does he tell you is the extent of the contact he had with Olivia on the 23rd of July? Initially, he told me when she arrived um, and pulled in front of his, uh, his grandmother's house, he... Jamari Cook entered her vehicle. And where'd they go in that initial version? They didn't go anywhere. They just sat in the car. Right outside his grandma's house? Yes. And uh, did he indicate... Um, so after he told you that um, he and Jamari had gone nowhere but gotten into the vehicle of Olivia, what did you do next? I confronted him with that information and asked him if he was sure about that. And after you said, if, after you confronted the defendant, what, if anything, was now said to you that seemed different to you? He then remembered that, in fact, he had, he had ridden with um, Olivia. She drove to the lake with Jamari, and they had gone to um, the lake. And and is, that where, is that how you know about this area where the band shell and the lake is located? Yes. Okay. And during this conversation, during this por portion of your interview with the defendant, what, if anything, does he say about whether he got out of the vehicle at that parking lot at the band shell? He said that uh, I asked him and, that he, he did not get out. And what about, what, if anything, does he say about whether Olivia got out of the vehicle during this portion of your conversation? He said that she didn't get out. And what, if anything, does he say about whether Jamari uh, Cook gets out of the vehicle uh, during this period of time uh, at, uh, uh, at the band shell uh, in the parking lot? He remained in the car as well. And what, in this version, what does he say then happens next? So uh, they're at the band shell at the parking lot for a period of time. Then what does he say happens? That she then... Um Drives them back and drops them off back at the grandmother's house. Okay. And where does the defendant say he proceeds next? I believe he goes at, least at his uh, grandmother's house. Okay. Does he ultimately indicate he visits somewhere else later that night? Um, I believe he went, said he went to the hospital. And when you say hospital, did he refer to or, or did you know which hospital he meant based on the rest of your investigation in this case? Um, yes. So what hospital was he referring to based on the rest of what you knew in this case? I believe he was referring to Kenosha Hospital. Okay. And ultimately, did the defendant, what if the defendant say different to you in your discussions with him about whether he actually went to the hospital that night or not? What did he ultimately say to you regarding that point? That he thought he'd gone to the hospital, but then he changed that. Um, I knew it wasn't that night. It was the night before. Got it. Okay. 
And uh, now that you've heard him uh, say, now that you've heard the defendant say, we did go to the lake, but when we were at the lake, we never got out of the car, and then we got dropped back off. When that was the version the defendant was telling you, what, if anything, did you say next to him? I again said, are you sure about that? Um, I suggested that the area by the band shell, due to vandalism, other um, activities, um, may be uh, monitored by cameras. So I, it may show that they actually got out of the car. Now, in fact, were there cameras there? No. So that was, that was you bluffing? Yes. And when you brought up the possibility that cameras might be uh, in that area by the band shell or parking area, what, if anything, different did the defendant say to you now? No, his version was that they, in fact, did get out of the car. Meaning all of them? Yes. And when his version was that they got out of the car, what did he say happened? That he and Jamari, the defendant, uh, walked um, down by the beach and um, Olivia remained up by her vehicle. And did he say why they went uh, down by the beach? Yes, they were there to buy some marijuana. And uh, did you further question him about uh, how that could occur in the context of what he had told you? Um, yes. All right. And what were your uh, questions or what in general were you saying that uh, caused you to express doubt to him uh, about whether this could be possible? About Because I, um, I then I asked him, you had earlier told me you weren't even at the lakefront, now you're out. I said, then who, you know, how long did you remain um, at the lakefront once you bought the weed? We're going to buy the weed. All right. And did he indicate specifically who he was going to buy it from? Um, a person by the nickname of Dizzy. All right. And did he indicate how Dizzy would know that he was going to be at the lakefront at this time? According to the defendant, some, at some point earlier in the day on Sunday, July 23rd, 2017, he'd had contact with Dizzy, um, but he wasn't specific as to how Dizzy knew to be there at that particular time. So after hearing this version of events, uh, did you continue to question the defendant? Yes. And as you continued to question the defendant, uh, did he indicate uh, something about uh, um, Olivia actually being in his presence during some of the time on the beach? Yes. And did he indicate to you uh, then that he had witnessed something, and Olivia and, and her presence on the beach with some, uh, in terms of something happening? Yes. And uh, who did he now, uh, who, if anyone, did he now bring up and suggest was also a, a party was at the beach somehow. A person by the name of Andrew Crom. And who provided this name, Andrew Crom? Um, the defendant, Mr. Tate. And how did he say Andrew Crom came into this incident? It, it was coincidence. Well, in this particular version, um, the defendant, Mr. Tate, indicated that as Olivia was driving to the the lakefront they passed this Andrew Crom who happened to be walking in the area and they briefly stopped. She said something to him and they continued to the lakefront. And as they were on the beachfront, he walked up on um, the, their particular group. It had been the defendant, Mr. Tate, Olivia, and uh, Jamari Cook. And then what did uh, the defendant say happened then? There was a brief conversation, I mean, it estimates a minute or so, and then um, for no apparent reason, this Andrew Crom began to choke Olivia McKay. Did he say that Andrew Crom did anything else other than choke Olivia? Uh, threw her down, face down into the sand. And did he indicate uh, anything that Andrew Crom had said while he was uh, choking or ending the life of Olivia? He mentioned something about hearing um, Andrew Crom say something about, this has to do with about you taking my lunch money. Detective, uh, uh, who ended this interview? Uh, Mr. Tate. And have you had an opportunity uh, pursuant to this investigation to have individuals look into any connection between uh, Olivia and uh, 
this individual, Andrew Crom? Yes. And were there any ways to document or connect those two individuals? Not that I'm aware of. And did uh, the defendant indicate who was present other than himself when this Andrew Crom choked Olivia? Jamari Cook. Now, Detective, pursuant to this investigation, did you have an opportunity to, uh, to take uh, uh, Jamari Cook's uh, phone? Yes. Did Jamari Cook provide his code so that you were able to get in and get access to that phone? Yes. And uh, pursuant to that uh, look on his phone, were you able through that phone town download to have some access to his Facebook? Yes. And were you able to see his interactions on Facebook uh, during uh, the period of time after he obtained that phone? Yes. And uh, were you able to obtain any other phones uh, that uh, had been at some point in the possession of Jamari Cook or his household? I know there are a lot of phones. Um, there may have been, but I'm not sure. On that. All right. Was there an Apple phone found during a search warrant at Jamari's home? Yes. Were you able, pursuant to your investigation, to, uh, to be sure that was not a phone that belonged to uh, Olivia? Yes. Detective, were you able, pursuant to this investigation, were you and other officers able to review Olivia's Facebook records, her phone uh, records, to see if there were any interactions between herself and Jamari Cook? Yes. And were there any interactions between Olivia McKay and Jamari Cook on any of her devices or, uh, or means of communication? Not that I'm aware of. And were you able to review the defendant, Daniel Tate's uh, phone and Facebook records, Meet Me records, those different avenues of communication? Yes. And uh, is it correct that there were interactions between the defendant and Jamari Cook involved in those uh, records? Is that true? Jamari Cook or, or Olivia? Between the defendant and Jamari Cook. There, yes, were, yes. there were records. Yes. Now, I, I'm just going to briefly ask you uh, if uh, you were involved in sending items to the crime lab or was that done by uh, the Mount Pleasant Police Department or uh, persons who collected those uh, things from the state? Do you recall? The, I believe Mount Pleasant did most of the um, okay. sending of the items to the crime lab. Detective, pursuant to this investigation, did uh, uh, officers have an opportunity to interview uh, a person identifying herself as the girlfriend of Jamari Cook, Kaylee Lalonde? Yes. And was she cooperative in this case? Yes.
detective pursuant to the investigation in this case was the uh, a person by the name of Dizzy identified by name. Yes. And was that name Daryl Crandall? Yes. And pursuant to this case, was Daryl Crandall interviewed by law enforcement? Yes. And uh, again, uh, was Daryl Crandall cooperative in this investigation? Yes. I have no further questions. I'm sorry. Uh, Council has some uh, uh, questions in another area, Your Honor. Detective, when you were investigating this case, did you become aware of a place called the Knights Inn? Yes. And how did you become aware of that? We received a crime um, stopper's tip that the defendant, uh, Daniel Tate, had been at that location attempting to sell um, the vehicle belonging to Olivia McKay. Did you respond to that location? Yes, I did. And what, if anything, did you see at that location when you responded? And the day that um, Detective Traxler and I went up there, that was August 8th, um, we met with the person that Mr. the defendant, uh, Daniel Tate, attempted to sell the car to. And did you notice that there were any recording devices at that hotel? While we were at the Knights Inn in um, Mount Pleasant, yes, we did notice that there were um, cameras on the outside of the uh, motel. And were you able to get footage from the uh, 24th? Yes, of July 2017, yes. And did you review that footage? Yes. And what, if anything, did you see on that footage that was relevant to your case? It shows um, a vehicle, um, in appearance, the same type of vehicle that um, Olivia Key owned the uh, silver Pontiac Grand Prix. And is it fair to say that there were a couple of different clips that showed that vehicle? Yes. And did you review all of the surveillance that was from that place? Yes. And was there anything about the time stamp on that surveillance that was of note? Yes. The time on the um, video cameras at the night in is an Eastern Standard Time, so they're an hour ahead of us. And were the individual videos time stamped? Yes. So they were an hour off? Correct. Now, I'm going to, before you came to court today, were you able to review clips from the nights in surveillance? Yes. And did those be true and accurate copies of what you uh, received from the Knights Inn? Yes. I'm going to play the first one, and just for the record, it is the file 170724, 1734-59-173610. And Detective Duffy, if you could explain to people what they're seeing as soon as it opens. That's the... Um parking lot um, of the Knights Inn. Um, in the general area, the person we came to speak to that day, uh, one of them was a Raven Deckert, and she was um, living in room 332. And do we see room 332 here, if you can recall? It's in there, but I, I don't know exactly where it's at. Now, on the Detective Duffy, we're having a lot of trouble hearing you now. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's there, but I just can't. I don't know what particular door it is. Now on the top, there's a timestamp that says 724-17-1735, currently it says 02. So you indicated that this would be Eastern Standard Time. So doing the math, would this be 4.35 p.m. our time? Yes. Okay. And what are we going to be viewing on this video? Um, you'll see a vehicle um, arriving. It's a silver Pontiac Grand Prix, and there'll be two occupants in it. So tell us when you start to see that vehicle. Right there. It's pulling in, it says parking now. So it's the one that just pulled so off the, yeah, the street? Yeah, it, yep, it just pulled into the parking spot. Let's back it up a little bit. Straighten out. And it's parked again. Now, what is the second clip that was relevant to your investigation? I believe the, they come out and move, the, the vehicle's moved. And I, uh, let's see the picture I can pause oh, right. So narrate this as you see uh, what was relevant. What, first of all, what is the time of this next clip, roughly? It's 4.38 uh, p.m. on uh, Monday, July 24th, 2000. So minutes after the first clip we watched? Yes. Right. 
there is the vehicle that arrived three minutes earlier is now pulling away um, and heading out of there's an entrance and it appears that one of the passengers um, is wearing the uh, blue surgical glove. When you first saw this uh, video, were you able to then pause it and get a still shot uh, yeah. closer to the car? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 56. Can you tell me what that appears to be? That's a still shot of this video clip um, as the car had backed out and, and is about to head um, in the forward direction and it appears that the, pa the passenger seat in the right front passenger seat is wearing a surgical glove. And does that appear to be a true and accurate still that was taken from that video? Yes. Does anything appear to be changed about it or altered in any way? No. Your Honor, I'd ask to move State's Exhibit 56 into evidence and publish it to the jury. Any objection? No. <coughs> excuse me, no objection. So where do you, you where do you see this glove portion? If you look, the window is down in the right front passenger window, and the person sitting in the right front passenger seat has their um, forearm on the um, open window in the uh, kind of green here, but uh, that white appearing um, object is a uh, glove. And we were able to confirm that by speaking with Raven Decker. So after this, so in this video at 438 then pulls off screen when is the next time that relevant video can be seen if you recall i don't recall the exact time um, but the vehicle does come back um, i've now opened up a clip that's 724 17 190926 so with the time uh, correction, that would be 6.09 p.m.? Correct. And what are we going to see on this clip? The vehicle will be coming back to this area. As you can see, it's coming back through the, the lot again, pulling in. Stopped. And that's the uh, Pontiac Grand Prix Silver and Color Florida. And who just got out of the driver's seat of that car? It appears it's Damari Cook. Last video I'm going to show you is 1913-43-191604. What are we going to see on this clip? I believe you're going to see the car leaving again. And with the timestamp being 1913-44, would that, in all actuality, be 6:13:44 p.m.? Yes, yeah, Central Standard Time. And please let me know if you see anyone or recognize anyone associated with this case. Mario Quick just walked back into the um, picture along uh, with uh, Daniel Tate who's wearing the hoodie, the white hoodie sweatshirt with the hood up. So who got in the driver's side? Um, Jamari Cook. And who got in the passenger side? Daniel Tate.
And now it's 6.15 p.m. Is that the last time they're seen on the nights in surveillance? Yes. And does the clips that I just showed you appear to be true and accurate uh, copies of what was taken from nights in security? Yes. Does anything appear altered about it or changed in any way? No. Your Honor, I would move State's Exhibit 2 into evidence. Is there objection? No. Received. Now, pursuant to this investigation, did you have an opportunity to review Facebook records for the defendant? Yes. And were those official business records that were given to you by Mount Pleasant and also your investigation? Yes. And was one of the conversations you reviewed from those Facebook records with someone named on Facebook, Suze, S-U-Z-A-Y, Nicole? Yes. And were you ever able to identify who Suze Nicole was? Yeah, it said Susan Bagdala. And is that someone who was familiar with the defendant? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 36. Now, are you aware that Facebook records are in UTC time? Yes. And you are, are you aware of what that means? That means they're um, going to be off uh, ahead of us by five hours. So I'm going to show you this exhibit, and I'm going to have you start reading at the top. So starting at the top, what day are we talking about here doing the time conversion? Would that be the 23rd of July at approximately 3.01.58 p.m.? Yes. Okay. And who is the author of this message? Um, that is the profile name used on Facebook by the defendant, Daniel Tate, DJ Youngin. And DJ Youngin says to Suze Nicole, whatever, dude, I'm not going to argue with you. Stop fucking around and come home. And then does Suze Nicole then respond? Yes, her response is, I am. And then DJ Youngin responds with WYM in is that commonly what you mean you are? Yeah, that's slang and the abbreviations that they use on um, texting and such and sending messages. And Suze Nicole responds on the 23rd of July at approximately 3.04 p.m. We agreed to get our shit first because I refused to run the streets again with the baby, correct? Correct. And then DG Youngin responds at 3.04 p.m. and 40 seconds on the 23rd. We can do it quick ASF, is that as fuck? Yes. And I just got to grip a steamer or two and get a job. Is that, is that what that says? Yes. Now, prior to this case, were you aware of what a steamer was? Um, not in this context, but yes. Um, and do you see then where Suze Nicole, her next message is, then do it? Yes. And does this appear to be true and accurate um, excerpts from the Facebook records of the defendant's DG Youngin profile with Suze Nicole Susan Bagdala. Yes. Does anything appear changed about the messages that we just went over in court? No. Your Honor, I would move State's Exhibit 36 into evidence. Objection. No. Steve. All right. Next, I'm going to show you Facebook messages that are State's Exhibit 37. Can you identify who DG Youngin is speaking to in these messages? Um. Author is a person by the name of Amanda Hanneman. And was she someone that you became familiar with in this investigation? Um, yes. So I'm going to direct your attention to the bottom of the first page of these, uh, specifically right here. Now, this says 724 of 2017, but it's at 015103. Given the time difference, would that be 851? p.m. of the 23rd? Yes, so it would be on uh, Sunday, July 23rd, 2017. And the time would have been 8.51. And what does Amanda Hanneman say to the defendant that night? Um, says, let me come over for a bit. And the defendant then responds. And how does the defendant then respond? Okay, I got a lady friend coming over at 10, though. All right, now I'm going to direct your attention to a different page, specifically starting at this message. 
So that once again says 724 um, 2017 at 21044. So would that be 9 10 p.m. our time? Yes. And what does Amanda Hanneman ask the defendant? Um, who is she? And how does the defendant respond to that? He responds, um, some of later he says her name is Olivia. And how does Amanda Hanneman respond to that? I want to go look and see what she looks like. So what's her name on Facebook? Now we're going to jump forward a little bit here to this message below this meme of Robin Williams. That is the defendant, D.G. Young, incorrect? Yes. And this now says 724 of 2017 at 728 UTC. Yes. So with the conversion, would that be 228 AM? Yes. And what does the defendant say to Amanda Hanneman? Um, a, I'm bad. And what does Amanda Hanneman say back? W, Y, D. Is that potentially slang for what you doing? Yes. And how does the defendant respond? He uh, responds by uh, sending back a message saying, shit, being bored as fuck. And that would be the early morning hours of the 24th at approximately 2.42 a.m.? Yes. Do these appear to be true and accurate representations that were printed from the official business records of Facebook? Yes. Did anything appear to be changed or altered in any way? No. Your Honor, I would move States Exhibit 37 into evidence. Is there objection? No. Received. I'm now handing you more Facebook records between the defendant and a Jocelyn Marie. States Exhibit 34. Do those appear to be official Facebook business records that you were given in this case? Yes. And when does the conversation seemingly start with Jocelyn Marie uh, right here? Starts on um, the 20... So it's a 724.17 at 7.51 UTC. See, so be back um, after, after the 23rd around. Would that be the 24th? I posit. Would that be the 24th at approximately 2:51 a.m.? Yes. And what is the message that D.G. Youngin sends to Jocelyn Marie? Yo, baby, daddy, up. And how does Jocelyn Marie respond to that? He's not my baby daddy. He's my kid's father. But hold on. And how? What then does Jocelyn Marie profile say? What's up? And how does the defendant respond? This, this Dwayne. Now at this point, it's 7:24 at 16:03. So approximately, what time is that our time? Twenty. Oh, two. No. 11-ish. 11:03. 11 11:03 a.m. on the 24th. And. D.G. Young and says, this Dwayne, and how does Jocelyn Marie's profile respond? Oh boy, what's up? Lots of laugh, hello. And what does D.G. Young and say back to that? You know anybody trying to buy this steamer? And how does Jocelyn Marie's profile respond? Um, hot car. And how does D.G. Young and initially respond? Nah. And how does Jocelyn Marie's profile respond? Whole. And what does D.G. Young and say to that? Nah. What does Jocelyn Marie's profile say to that? What? An LOL, lots of laughs. And what does DG Youngin respond to that? My fault, G uh, WYM. And is that commonly what you mean? Yes. And how does Jocelyn Marie respond to that message? She responds by saying, What's a steamer? And how does the defendant respond to that message on the 24th at approximately 11.08 a.m.? Um, he responds, a stolen car, but it's from out of town. And how does Jocelyn Marie's profile respond to that? That's what I asked. Nah, bro, lots of laugh. Now, do these records that I just showed you appear any different than the ones that you reviewed as part of this case? No. Do they appear altered in any way? No. 
Your Honor, I would move State's Exhibit 34 into evidence. Is there an objection? No. Now I'm showing you a Facebook conversation between the defendant and a Dewan Rodriguez Price, State's Exhibit 32. Do these appear to be official Facebook records, business records that you were given as part of this investigation? Yes. Okay. And I'm going to show you uh, a conversation starting on what appears to be 7.53 UTC time on the 24th, which I think with our math is 2.53 AM on the 24th. Does that sound correct? Yes. Okay. And what does DJ Young and how does he start this conversation on the 24th? Hey, unknown, we got to talk on some uh, real shit. And how does Dewan Rodriguez Price respond approximately 11 minutes later? Okay, what's up? And what is the defendant's response to that? Don't anybody trying to get a steamer like ASAP. And that would be at approximately 3.05 a.m. on the 24th? Yes. Okay, so then we jump forward to approximately 3.10 a.m. on the 24th, and how does the defendant then send his next message? Um, three question marks, it appears. And then it appears we jump ahead approximately 11 hours. So with our math, would that be approximately 2.14 p.m. on the 24th? Yes. And what does the defendant next say to Dewan Rodriguez Price? Uh, UNK. And how, I, I, U, UNK. UNK. And how does Dewan Rodriguez Price respond to that approximately an hour later? No, NAW. And does these records appear to be altered in any way that you could tell? No. They appear to be true and accurate copies of the business records you uh, looked through as part of this case? Yes. Your Honor, I would move State's Exhibit. 32 into evidence. Any objection? No. Received. I'm next going to show you a Facebook conversation between the defendant and a Larry Filson Sr. as State's Exhibit 33. Do these appear to be official Facebook records, business records? Yes. And do they appear to be the ones that you reviewed as part of this investigation? Yes. Back from you. So I'm going to start at the top. And what is the first, what time is the first message and what is the first message? Um, the first, it's on the 24th, it would be, it'd be, it's, it's on the 24th of July, 2017, and it's a new TC time, so that's five hours back, seven o'clock, so that would be uh, like two in the afternoon, I believe, like two in the afternoon, two, 16 in the um, afternoon, and DJ Youngen, the defendant's um, profile name, uh, says, got a whip for sale, no title. And how does Larry Filson Sr. respond to that? He responds, what kind of car and whose car and is title just lost? And how does the defendant respond to that? Yeah, and I'll send pics, the pictures, just bought it for a band, but I'm getting a new one for cheaper in a couple weeks, so I'm trying to make money. And what does Larry Filson Sr. say back to that? Can't do anything with a car with no title. You're going to get whoever you bought it from file, uh, file a lost title. And how does DJ Young respond to that? All right. And what does Larry Filson Sr. say next? But send me pics, me pictures. And what does DJ Youngin say to that? Got you. Showing you what's the next page. What does this appear to be? Um, it's a uh, silver Pontiac Grand Prix, um, Grand Prix um, with a plate, Wisconsin plate 430 uh, ZPM, which is a plate that's registered to uh, last name of McKay. That's Olivia McKay's car. That's your driving. So that's that's Olivia McKay's car. Yes. Okay. And then that's sent next. What is that? That's just a profile. That's a side view of the same vehicle. And that is also Olivia McKay's car. Yes. Now, did the records I just showed you appear to be true and accurate uh, copies of what was taken from the official Facebook business records? Yes. Did anything appear altered about the records you just saw? 
Your Honor, I would move State's Exhibit 33 into evidence. <coughs> Any objection? No. Proceed. I'm handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 35, which is Facebook messages between D.G. Youngin and Rodney Pettis. Can you confirm that those are official Facebook records, business records that you received as part of this investigation? Yes. Can you read for the jury the first message sent, which appears to be 724 of 2017 at given the calculations 2.33 p.m. on the 24th? Um, steamer for sale. And how does Rodney Pettis respond to that? He responds, I'm good on the steamers, bro. I just bought a car last week. And how does the defendant respond to that? All right, man, none of your, your people need it. And how does Rodney Pettis respond to that. I can look for you, bro. And that was from the afternoon of the 24th? Yes. And what is the next thing the defendant says to Rodney Pettis? Need it gone like ASAP, as soon as possible. And that would be roughly 2.35 p.m. on the 24th? Yes. And how does Rodney Pettis respond to that? L-G-H-T. L-G-H-T. Is it possible it's I-G-H-T? Could be. Would that be I? Is that possible? Yes. Okay. Did anything about that communication look altered or changed in any way? No. Your Honor, I would move State's Exhibit 35 into evidence. Any objection? No. Received. I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 39 and 40. Can you tell me what 39 appears to be? 39 Facebook records um, of. DJ Young and the defendant's uh, profile on Facebook. And who is he speaking to in those records? He's speaking to a, an author, A. Ray Ray, who is um, actually the mother of his child, uh, Tamara Schluchterman. And that came out in your investigation that that's Tamara Schluchterman? Yes. Okay. And I'm handing you what's marked as State's Exhibit 40. Can you tell me what those are? Those are her um, records downloaded from her phone. So Tamara Schluterman or Schluterman allowed you to download her phone? Yes. And you were able to get her Facebook records? Yes. And who is this conversation with that she was having that you're holding in State's Exhibit 40? Um, she is having a conversation with um, the defendant, um, Daniel Tate. And in her phone is the defendant known as Daddy? Yes. And did you have a chance prior to court to review both of these sets of documents? Yes. And the corresponding conversations between the two of them from the day of the 24th yes. of July of 2017. Yes. And did these appear to be true and accurate copies of their Facebook records as you reviewed them uh, coming into court today? Yes. Your Honor, I would move States Exhibit 39 and 40 in evidence. Any objection? No. Received. I'm going to show you States Exhibit 57. Can you tell me what this is? This is a um, consolidation of the conversation uh, between Tamara Schlechterman and the defendant Daniel T. D. G. Youngin, also known as Daddy. Um, on the right-hand side are the messages, a column where he's um, texting her, and on, I mean, a left for him, and on the right hand is um, Tammy Race. So is this essentially a summary of what his messages reflected from his Facebook records versus what her messages reflected from hers? Yes. And so on the right is Tamara Schluchterman's stuff that we took from her cell phone? Yes. And on the left would be the DG Youngin profile that we downloaded? Yes. And did you have a chance to review all of the content of these? Yes. And did they appear to be true and accurate representations of messages that were taken directly from the Facebook records you've already testified about? Yes. Okay, so on the left, there's a lot of blank space initially, but on the right is Tamara Schluterman's Facebook record that she had in her phone, correct? Yes. And how does her conversations with the defendant start on the 24th? Um, somewhere around 1250, uh, 9 a.m. in the morning on uh, Monday, July 24th, um, she responds to a message from the defendant, Daniel Tate, What's wrong? I can't hear none. Okay, so prior to that, on 724 at about 12.58 a.m., it says, you missed a call from Daddy. 
So these are Facebook calls. So is this Daniel Tate calling her, which is reflected in her Facebook records? Yes. And so we see that she missed a call from Daddy. Yes. So at 12.59 a.m., we see again, you missed a call from Daddy. So that's the defendant calling her phone again through Facebook Messenger. Correct. And then the next message we see in blue, which has the name Tate next to it, says answer ASAP, correct? Yes. And she responds in pink with what's wrong, I can't hear none. Yes. And he responds with, I need the address to the hospital ASAP. Yes. And then at 101 AM, Tamara Schluterman's Facebook Messenger indicates that she missed a call from daddy. Yes. And then Tamara's Facebook records indicate that she sent back a letter Y. Yes. And her Facebook records indicate that he then sent Tamara like now. Correct. He then also sends, is anybody in room? I need to talk to you like ASAP. Yes. And she responds with yes. And then she responds with what's wrong with you? And I'm tired as fuck or AF. Excuse me. Yes. And then he responds with how many people I need to talk to you like ASAP, just me and you, Tamara, FR, FR. Is that often for real, for real? Yes. So that's how he responds to her in her Facebook messages. Correct. And she responds two, but I'm only allowed two. Correct? Yes. And then she responds about what? And then talk to me in the AM. Correct. And he responds with, okay, I'm going to be up at the hospital around 9.45, 10 o'clock. Please be up. Correct? Correct. And she responds with, okay, what do you want to talk about? You going to leave or something? Because that's what it sounds like. Correct. He responds with, no, Tamara, but I G to G. Is that commonly got to go? Got to get going, yes. No, Tamara, but I got to go. Just send me the address, please. I love you guys, and I'll see you soon. She responds, you got in trouble with somebody, bro, or bra. And he responds with, dude, I got to go for real. Is that all accurate? Yes. Now, there is nothing on the left-hand side here for what the defendant's Facebook records said about this conversation. So based on your training experience as a detective and going through Facebook records, what is the fact that his Facebook records that we got from Facebook show nothing while she had a whole conversation with him? What does that mean to you? that they've been deleted. So people can delete Facebook messages that then don't show up on Facebook records? They can. But according to Tamara Ray's, this whole conversation happened. Yes. So we're going to move on to approximately start at 4.51 a.m. And now these messages seemingly line up a little bit better. Is that a fair statement? Yes, it's still early morning hours of Monday, July 24, 2007. Okay, so at 4.51 a.m., Tamara says, I wish you would say something about what's so important. This she makes me worried, FR, FR, and who's coming up here with you, correct? Yes. And he responds with, you going to help me out or not? Nah? And then responds with J. Yes. At 4.52 a.m., she indicates, yeah, I'll, I'll try, of course. I just wanted to know what's so important that you seem so desperate and okay, who's driving you? That's what I meant. And he responds with, I really need you to just STF you. And is that commonly shut the fuck up? Yes. So I really need you to just shut the fuck up. Please just shut the fuck up. Okay. We need it gone ASAP. That's that. And she responds with SMHTF. And does that have a common meaning? That's her. Is that possibly shaking my head the fuck? It could be. I can't say for sure. Okay. Moving along. So now on his Facebook messages, we have another one that happens at 4.56 a.m. that's not reflected in hers. Correct. Given what you know about Facebook, does that mean that she deleted these next two messages so hers didn't reflect it, but his still did? Yes. And the next message at 4.56 is from him. Can you please just stop asking questions before I really have to leave? Just please look around for me. I'll have pictures before we get there. Okay, love you, night. And she responds with, okay, but you coming early in the morning when MFs ain't even awake to buy nothing. Do we know what MF usually stands for? Is 
that commonly motherfuckers. Yes. And so those are reflected in his Facebook records, but not hers. Correct. At 4.59 a.m., he indicates, that's okay. I really just need you to trust me on this, okay? And she responds with, you're not staying long. You just coming to talk, but nights and don't come till like 10.30. And he responds with thumbs up emoji. And she responds with thumbs up emoji. Correct. At 5 a.m., he states, and after I get the money, I'm staying as long as I can. I just got to grab pills from Mata somehow. Correct? Yes. And now, once again, her side of the conversation is missing the next two, but his has uh, content. So is it your belief that she deleted the next two messages? Yes. So she indicates, oh, mm, okay, emoji, how much you trying to sell this steamer for and don't say UDK. You don't. UDK, commonly you don't know. Yes. And he responds to that message with trying for nine, nothing under 650, cars basically brand new. And she responds, okay, or okay. He responds, thank you for real, for real. Yes. She responds, yeah, or yeah. And he responds, I'll hit you up before I leave. And she gives him a thumbs up emoji. Correct. All accurate? Correct. Moving to 8.58 a.m., she says to him, you're still coming at 10.30 or no? And he indicates yes. And at 9.01, she says K. And at 9.03 a.m., his Facebook records indicate that she sends him don't forget pics. Is that correct? Correct. But her Facebook records that she gave you don't reflect that, correct? Correct. So the assumption is that was deleted on her end? Yes. So she says don't forget pics. And he responds with, got you, it's just going to be me coming up. Just please try and make sure nobody else is there if possible, since you want to know so bad. She indicates, okay, I'm sending them gone, but they not leaving till 1030. Daniel Tate responds, okay, at 907, okay, well, I'm going to be downstairs before 1030. So when 1025 comes, I'll keep watch from outside. She responds, keep watch from outside for what? LOL and okay, and she then responds, What time you gone be here? What time you gone be here? And he responds, For them, I'm gonna be there at like 10. All accurate? Yes. And then she indicates that 9 08 a.m. isn't a waste of gas to come up here just to talk to me for a few minutes. I want, I mean, I want to see you, of course, but can't you just call me or call from Mata's phone? and save yourself the trouble. And he responds, Tamara, if I get money, I can come see you when I want. Plus, I need to get this whip off. Why are you so impatient? Like, can you re really not just trust me? And she responds at 910, I do trust you. I'm getting to middle things easier for you. And she gives an asterisk trying to make language that would that be accurate yes and he responds with i want to see you tamara faster i can get this whip off the faster i can come back get my pills and shit and stay with you for a few days and she says okay all accurate yes at 9 13 a.m he responds with i need you to make me promises to promise sorry, i need you to make me two promises on jaylani is that correct? Yes. Who is Jaylani? That is the um, daughter uh, who is yet to be born of um, Emily Schluckman and. So that's the name they gave their daughter that was yet to be born at this point? Correct. She was. So he's asking Tamaray to make him promises on his unborn daughter? Correct. And Tamaray says, um, okay, I will only make them if I can guarantee. And Tate responds at 9.15 a.m., you won't ever, ever tell anyone what I tell you about this situation, okay, and then anyone in all caps. Correct. And she says, okay, promise. She then follows that up at 9.15 a.m. with, you're scaring me, uh, LOL 100 emoji. And then she corrects it to say, asterisk little, or lol. Correct? Correct. And he then responds with, I'm sorry, you ready for the next one? And she says, yes, sir. And his response at 9.18 a.m. on the 24th is, you won't hold this over me with my daughter. And 
she responds, if it's gone, gone, put her into a dangerous situation, then hell yeah, I will, 100 emoji. He responds, it's not, I promise you, absolutely promise you, it's all over. She responds with, okay, then I promise I won't. And at 9.21 a.m., he says, thank you, look, I know you're probably gonna look at me different after this, but I got a L-Y-K-R-N, is that let you know right now? This, yes. the life I chose, not saying it's always happening or always going to, just need you to know the truth. And she says, okay, with a question mark. And then she responds with, really, I'm not trying to sound bogus, but it matter how I look at you anymore. Nah, it doesn't. All that matters is rather I think you can effectively take care of our daughter and keep her safe, feed, clothed, and happy, 100 emoji. All accurate? Yes. He then responds at 923 with, and I need you to be honest with me just in case this change. And she says, okay. He says, I feel you and I know I can be honestly, but honestly, do you love me? Like for real, for real, FRFR. Just love me to fucking pieces like I love you. I need to know that I can still be loved before I tell you. She then responds to that. I mean, yeah, I love you. I love you a lot, 100 emoji. Maybe in a different way than I had a month ago, but of course I love you. I don't have a doubt in my mind about it. And even if I didn't love you, that doesn't mean somebody, someone else wouldn't. And he responds, you're the only one that makes it really mean something to me though. And then follows that up with at least our end, would that be right now? So at least right now. Yes. She responds with, how's that? I mean, really, we've been through now shit <clears throat> than relationships go through in years. We don't handle it right. Eve, I mean, I'm glad that means something to you. Don't get me wrong. And he states, I get it. And honestly, I don't know. I guess the fact that together or not, when I really needed you, you was there. I mean, my own parents ain't even on a on it, on it, O-N-N-A-T. She indicates at 9.32, ah, I feel you, I guess so, but that's also a part of caring about being down for someone, at least that's how I look at it. She then continues, and I know you don't like your dad or Barbie, but they both ask about you a lot to see if you're okay and stuff, 100 emoji. It's not like they just wash their hands of you, but I understand where you're coming from. He responds at 9.34 a.m. with, like what? Like I know my dad cares, I just can't stand him sometimes. It's better off that he isn't completely in my life. She responds with, okay, well I just wanted you to know, they ask about you. Now I don't really tell him nothing because up until four days ago, I ain't even talked to you, but still. And she then responds again, sometimes it'd be like that. That's why I left my parents young. He says, yeah. She responds, mm-hmm. She then says, uh, I hope whatever you got going on that you okay, Danny, 100 emoji. And his response at 9.41 a.m. is, I'm honestly not stressing about it. It honestly don't bother me up until I think to the point that in real life don't make me even second guess. Then it just makes make me feel crazy. But in this day and age, maybe that ain't too bad. And she responds with, aw, uh, maybe. And then, well, my people just left, so, and he responds with, okay, I need the address. And she sends 3807 Spring Street. What is 3807 Spring Street? It's a Wheaton Franciscan Hospital located in the north side of Racine, Wisconsin. And at 9.51 a.m., he indicates, thank you, don't answer none of my people text till I come talk to you and be there within the hour. Accurate? Yes. He then sends love and love you see you soon and she responds at 9:51 with none of your people like who and he responds anybody and she responds okay he responds jay daryl family friends nobody she responds k how are you getting here he responds friends whip she responds oh okay he responds see you soon 
Is that all accurate? Yes. Now, in this, at this point on this chart, his Facebook goes completely blank, but her Facebook shows uh, messages back and forth. Uh, is it your understanding that that would mean he deleted the next part of this conversation while she retained it? Correct. Okay. So at 10.42 a.m., it says, OMW up, would that be on my way up? Yes. And she responds with thumbs up emoji. He indicates, don't say shit in front of Jay, and she says, thumbs up emoji. And, oh, okay, you. And there's a video clip, and she responds with, y'all foods here. Now we're jumping ahead. So that was at 10.42 a.m., that initial portion. A video was sent at approximately 12.57 p.m., and the next text communication through Messenger from found on her phone is 2.07 p.m. Is that all accurate? Yes. But 2.07 p.m., she indicates, y'all food here, take your shirt from the closet, and you never told me what you was supposed to tell me, question mark, question mark, side smile emoji. And he responds with later, and she responds later when, because I really wanted to K-M-O-W, and then she corrects it to be to know, thanks for coming to see me though, he responds with N-P, is that no problem or not a problem? That, that was yes. It. And she responds, I don't want you to leave upset, my bad, and, but you're not spending the night tonight or tomorrow. And he responds, probably not. Now on this next page, his Facebook records still show nothing. So is that because that conversation was deleted off of his messages? Yes. And she indicates, okay, side smile emoji, you're not coming back soon, huh? And he responds, I don't know, or I'm sorry, IDK Tamaray, is that I don't know? Yes. She responds, you could have hugged me by though, sad face emoji. She then says, I only get to see you like once every two weeks. It feels like sad face emoji, side smile emoji. And he responds, tried to get money. And she responds, that's the only reason you came. And he responds, I needed money to keep seeing you, Tamaray. And she responds at 3.24 p.m. I don't see why you need money to keep seeing me though. I mean, gas money, yeah but I could easily get you gas money, so IDK. He indicates just trying to help. She says, trying to help who? He responds at 346 with our situation dork. She responds with a thumbs up emoji. And she says to him, let me, I'm sorry, LMK, is that commonly let me know? Let yes. me know when you get where you're going so I know you're safe at least. Responds at 4.16 p.m. I'm sorry so many messages, but we really need to talk now, like ASAP, 100 emoji, 100 emoji, it's serious. And at 5.33 p.m., she responds, Danny, I love you, and no matter what you do, or who you do it with, that don't change she. Jelani gone, love, I forever love you, no matter what to, Keep your head up and you'll always be the Danny I fell in love with. 100 emoji. Through all the bullshit, I still honestly believe you're that person that you allowed me to see. 100 emoji. I really, 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 really want you to come stay the night. And if I need find you a ride here and back, I will. 100 emoji. But we need to talk about a lot in all caps. That an accurate recitation of that portion. Yes. And at 714 PM he responds back, IK, is that commonly I know? Yes. So I know tomorrow for real, FR. Just got rid of it. I'll explain later. Kind of busy R N right now. She responds with, Okay, you had me worried. One hundred emoji, one hundred emoji, one hundred emoji. Promise you'll come tomorrow. I'll be sure to have a ride for you. 100 emoji. That way you ain't gotta worry. He responds with, okay, promise. She responds with, okay, hit me up later, okay. And you trying to come earlier in the day tomorrow, my auntie will come get you after Amanda's doctor appointment, so like noon, and he indicates sure says, okay, and my friend Taylor, or Taller, uh, will take you home Wednesday around the same time. She 
says, when sh where should I tell my auntie to pick you up from though? And he says, Sheridan in 46, I literally just told you I got to go GTG. She says, okay, sorry, I love you. Hit me up later. He says, love you too. She then says, be easy and try to remember my number in case you need it. 321-5615, TTYL, is that commonly talked to you later? Yes. And then at 9.09, she sends him a message, I love you, Danny, did you a lot of, a bunch of toothpaste in my sink or some? And where should I tell my auntie to pick you up from, though? Accurate? Yes. And all of these last messages were not found on his Facebook, but were found on hers. Does this appear to be a true and accurate copy of the entire conversation that could be pieced together between his Facebook and her Facebook on July 24th of 2017? Yes. Did anything appear to be missing or added to it from your review of the original Facebook records to this uh, chart? No. Your Honor, I would then move this state's exhibit 57 into evidence. Is there objection? No. Received. We have nothing further. It's going to organize. All right. Um, let's uh, take a break. And uh, please don't talk about the case during the break. Let's start again at uh, about, uh, oh, about five minutes, too.